Welcome, everyone, to a special draft edition of this podcast. I am uh, Brian Smith, and I am joined by Liam Willerup, student at the University of Miami and a huge fan of the NFL draft. We're going to talk a little bit about some of the top guys and possibilities of why a team may draft somebody or they wouldn't. And to be honest, the last couple of weeks, Liam, leading up to a draft are always fun because there's no limit to the articles and the people you can talk to about all the different rumors. And that's basically what we're here to do. So uh, I'm excited to get started, man. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, like you said, like talking about quarterback, for example, always people are talking about when are these guys going to go? They're talking about this class is one that's viewed as the one of the weaker ones, but now a guy like Malik Willis out of Liberty is viewed as a guy that could go as high as number two overall. So you never know what's going to happen. And uh, it's an exciting uh, weekend coming up soon. Absolutely. Absolutely. With that, Let's just uh, start off talking about the number one pick. There's been a lot of debate, and I don't. I, I know I told you off air. I don't think there is a quote unquote clear cut number one pick like last year. If you didn't draft Trevor Lawrence, eh, you're probably not very smart. Yeah. But but uh, this year does not designate such a prospect. And you know Trevor's kind of a rare, rarefied deal. This year it's more interesting though because there are more options. You know, do you draft need? Do you trade the pick, etc. So with that, are you believing that Travion, or Trayvon Walker from Georgia, the D lineman, could sneak up and end up being the top pick? That The guy that's the GM there has a history of taking some risky picks. What, what are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting situation out there in Jacksonville. You already have a guy on the edge that looks like he can have some promise in Josh Allen, uh, the former edge out of Kentucky. Uh, we saw him play very well against the Bills this year against the other Josh Allen. But uh, – I don't know if I'm buying the Trayvon Walker talk. It feels like people just trying to stir some stuff up. I see Mel Kuyper uh, put him like top three in his uh, mock draft. I see people saying there's no way he falls out of pick three. But um, it just comes down to production. And when you look at a guy, Aiden Hutchinson from Michigan, he was able to dominate extremely high on the college level. Uh, You know, a Heisman finalist himself. Um, You know, they have the issue with the uh, arm size. They think it's going to be hard for him to attack at the higher level. But You know, then you look at a guy like Walker who hasn't really produced on, uh, you know, the pass rush side, but he just has immense potential. You know, a guy who's a freak athlete. uh, People are raving about the fact that he's even dropped in the coverage at some point. uh, 6'5", I believe 270, um, freakish size. But, um, you know, he's got a great run stuffing ability, seven and a half TFLs um, in 13 games for the Bulldogs, playing on extremely stacked defensive line. (laughs) You know, with Jordan Davis, who people were posing as a Heisman candidate halfway through the last season, um, he's a guy who should go first round as well. Uh, but that that defense at Georgia is just something else. Kirby Smart's got a group out there. But, um, you know, Walker reminds me of a guy coming from last year's draft uh, from Penn State, not Micah Parsons, as you may think, but um, uh, Jason Odifioea, who ended up going to the Ravens, a guy who didn't have crazy production coming out of college, but people were just projecting him extremely high. Uh, at the next level, uh, you know, Odefe away didn't have any sacks at Penn State, you know, playing alongside Parsons. But uh, kind of a similar situation with Walker, but I think Walker's just miles ahead as a prospect. Um, at the end of the day, though, I think Hutchinson's got to be the pick. Uh, he's the safest guy to work alongside Allen. Uh, you know, those guys are going to be able to bolster each other's abilities out there. Uh, I think offensive line's been a position that uh, Jacksonville has walked away from, given that they signed in Brennan Scherf from the Commanders. Uh, re-signed Cam Robinson on a franchise tag. And I think they still have some belief in Walker Little potentially to play right tackle for them. So uh, not looking to protect Trevor Lawrence, uh, I guess, with these this pick. But I think surefire in a defense that, you know, that's the reason why Doug Peterson and his Eagles, uh, you know, the new coach out there in Jacksonville, won that Super Bowl against Tom Brady and the Patriots right. a couple years back due to that stout defense they had. Yeah, if you don't win games in the trenches, you generally don't win games. Uh, even in the NFL with the ridiculous rules for DBs where if they touch somebody, there's a flag. It still starts with the ability to get to the passer. You need some freebies. And part of it's the rules and whatnot. So a D lineman like Hutchinson, um, why he ends up being number one or two or three, wherever he ends up going, anywhere in there, I get it. The same thing with Walker. They're just guys that you you need have as many as possible and to fire as many bullets as possible in that area. So I agree. Both of them are great players. And, you know, if Hutchin goes number one, it's not a surprise. So second thing, Lions, best player available for them. 
Um, this, this could be a, uh, I could project this five years from now. I could be asking you this same question because they're always in the top five. Um, it's just, it's horrific, but welcome to the Detroit Lions of the last 35 years. Um, with, you know, they got Willis, there's Walker, there are different guys that they could take going offense, going defense. Can we at least narrow it down to which side of the ball and then work our way from there? Is, is that, is that, you know, is that plausible? Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, the Willis talk was extremely high after his pro day, but at the end of the day, everyone's going to make a great throw during their pro day. It's going to wow people. You know, Corral out of Ole Miss just had a great pro day. Uh, Ritter's been showing out, so on and so forth. I don't think it's offensive side of the ball they look towards because you'd either be taking a quarterback here in Willis or you'd be going offensive line. But, you know, they just took Panay Sewell, the stout offensive tackle, out yep. of Oregon. Uh, they have Taylor Decker. They have a, they have a pretty good group out there. Frank Ride now top paid center in the league. Uh, I think it's going to be on the defensive side of the ball. And when it comes down to it, um, you know, they got to get a game changer is what I think that the position of need is for them, whether that be a defensive edge uh, with Thibodeau or Walker, or they, it might be, it's going to be an unpopular thing to say right now, crazy enough, because he's been falling down boards, but why not a guy like Hamilton who, you know, he can really bring some versatility out there, some range for that uh, secondary who, um, you know, has been missing that from a guy like Jeff Okuda, who, you know, went third overall from Ohio State a couple of years ago and just hasn't been on the field and hasn't really showed much promise. But um, I think the best case scenario for them realistically would be to trade down with a team like the Saints potentially looking to trade their two first round picks up for a quarterback. Um, there it but, is. You know, you can always hope that the trades are going to happen, but I always get let down when it comes down to it. <laughs> Same. Um, <laughs> exactly but you know Campbell he's a defensive guy you know he's going to build through the trenches and um I, I think it's got to be an edge defender and you know it's going to be whatever they see between Thibodeau or uh Walker because Thibodeau's fallen drastically in these last couple of day uh weeks it seems like he's been as low as 10 on some mock drafts while a guy like Walker you know is projected as first overall um and they don't really have a surefire like like edge on that team like Jacksonville does have Josh Allen in the right. bottom there. So um I think it's got to be edge and you know I can't make a huge decision here because I'm not the general manager of the Lions but um it's whoever they see between Thibodeau or Walker and I think one of those guys is going right off the board um the pick after or who knows what Houston's doing. They got two first rounders. Uh there's a lot of stuff up in the air but I'd say they they're going to go uh edge with Thibodeau or Walker. That, that is an organization that if you were a gambling man and even if you were an addict, you would not gamble on what they were going to do. The Detroit Lions, even long before you were born, have been a laughing stock in the NFL. And one of the reasons is they just make weird picks. And sometimes even when they make a sure pick, it still ends up as a bust. I mean, they drafted Barry Sanders and never came close to a Super Bowl. That's sad. So... <laughs> It, it's just amazing. Calvin Johnson never did anything. You know what I mean? And it's, it wasn't because of him. They just didn't put players around him. So I don't really have any idea what they're going to do. Uh, I wouldn't be shocked if they drafted an offensive lineman just because that doesn't make sense. Uh, yeah. That's that's the Lions. Um, another one that's interesting would be the New York Giants. Um, they're an organization that is – it seems like they're, they're shooting a lot of blanks. They're always quote unquote meddling. They're like a seven and nine kind of team. You're a couple of players away, but then you lose a guy to free agency or whatever. There's a chance for a trade and they don't get it done, whatever. They just never seem to quite get over the top here recently. What do you think about the Giants and, and their situation in the first round? So, you know, they're picking five and seven courtesy of a Justin Fields trade from last year, which they ended up getting Kadarius Tony from Florida out of that. But, uh, you know, with, with, back to, with almost back to back picks like that, you're looking to add two guys that can make a huge change to your roster. And especially in that division, which you never know with the Cowboys, they lost a lot of their good players this off season. Uh, the commanders, who knows what then they got Carson Wentz under the uh, center for them. And good luck. The Eagles, <laughs> they, they got a good group of players, but you know, Jalen Hurts has always been a question with them and people are always wondering, are they going to go quarterback eventually? Who knows? Uh, that's a question for next off season. But when it comes to the giants though, uh, Brian Dable is going to be on the hot seat and be able to develop these guys. You know, a very stout offensive coordinator who was able to develop uh, Josh Allen to one of the league's best quarterbacks out there in Buffalo. So um, we know it's not going to be quarterback. I'll tell you that because they're going to try and ride with Daniel Jones and see what they can make out of him because 
he may not have a great resume, but he's got some talent on him that if it can be tapped into, he can be a serviceable quarterback in this league. But um, I think offensive line's a position of need to be addressed here. Um, a guy that I really like would fit for them is going to be Ike Kwanu out of NC State. He's a fantastic run blocker. Um, it's just only if he follows the pick five. I've been seeing concerns recently about Evan Neal and his weight, you know, uh, kind of being similar to Makai Becton, who was uh, selected to the Jets just two years ago, who's now seen some injury issues. And who knows if they go another SEC offensive lineman after Andrew Thomas has had kind of a rocky start to his career. But I, I would assume that they would either go um, E.K. Aquanu or, I mean, maybe they do go SEC lineman to a guy with Charles Cross who had a young breakout age, which is a good thing people look for uh, when looking at prospects. And then I think at the seven turn, I'd love to have them go after Kyle Hamilton or a corner to go alongside uh, that group over there. Uh, yes. I think James Bradbury is going to be a guy that's on his way out, not fitting the timeline of this team. And, uh, you know, Hamilton could be a big playmaker for them. Maybe even a guy like Derek Stingley or uh, Sauce Gardner out of Cincinnati could be in play for them as well. I feel like being able to surefire a cornerback slot that's going to be locked down for them is essential, especially playing in a division where you're going up against CeeDee Lamb, Terry McLaurin, um, and Devontae Smith uh, multiple times a year. Um so I think the dream situation for them is that they get E.K. Aquanu out of NC State uh, with the fifth pick, and then they get Kyle Hamilton at the seven because uh, Aquanu is going to be a great run blocker, hopefully be able to rejuvenate reju the career of Saquon Barkley, who many are have been doubting. Uh, but I think it's going to be a fact of the O-line play that hasn't been great out there. Um, you know, they, they have been struggling out there of O-line, so that's got to be a position of address. And uh, a game changer on the defensive end would be awesome to see because wide receiver – I think it's a little bit too much of a reach for them since they, they're paying the highest paid receiver room in the NFL right now with guys like Galladay, Slayton, uh, Tony, um, and so many more. Shepard, it could go on and on. But uh, that's what I'd like to see the Giants do in this draft. I think it would be a good pick to go with the big fella out of NC State. Um, the Giants traditionally do well, especially since it's cold weather and all that. When they play games November and later, it's hard to play there. It's hard to throw. Uh, that stadium is notorious for not being very friendly to quarterbacks. So if you're a dominant run blocker, and as you said, he is, and he's a massive human being, that would be that would be my pick. Um, but, I mean, again, the Giants, they're six one way, a half dozen the other. Nothing would surprise me. Uh, your other idea with Hamilton, um, I think he's as good a player as there is in the draft. I think the 40-time stuff for a guy that weighs 220 pounds is way overrated. I like film. And I like watching him punish people. So I, I think he's a steal if they could get him at seven. Even if they got him at five, I think he would be a steal. But either way, um, the Giants need to make at least one of those hit right away because they just have not remotely come close to finishing on their talent compared to their record in the last several years. So I, I agree. Um, talking about somebody that uh, has failed in their organization has been under a lot of fire – is one we already mentioned. That would be the Jaguars. Um, mm -hmm. What What do you think besides the obvious? I mean, they're going to probably take one of the DNs first. What do you think would help their franchise the most? I mean, is it a position? Is it a chemistry thing? Is is it is it just we need talent all over? I mean, obviously, quarterback that'll take care of itself in time. That that's pretty much inevitable. I mean, if Trevor doesn't make it, then I don't know what to say because he's about as good a prospect as I've seen in my lifetime. What is next for them after that first pick, and what do they got to do? Well, unfortunately, they went through one of the most dumpster fire seasons we've seen in recent years. Urban Meyer was a complete utter fail in the NFL. Obviously, Oof. the whole situation, social media and everything like that, and you know, talking about he was kicking the kicker in the shin and all this stuff, a lot of stuff that just shouldn't be seen on the NFL level. And uh, I'm glad that era is over, and it's about turning over a new leaf. Uh, Doug Peterson's got to be able to bring this group back. Um, in terms of talent on this roster and where they need to look, um, you know, they spent a lot of money in free agency going after some guys, Christian Kirk, especially. Uh, they give a four year, $80 million deal from the receiver from uh, the Cardinals. Uh, I don't want to, I'm going to butcher his name, so I won't even say it, but the Atlanta Falcons linebacker, uh, Fose Ola, whatever, pardon me on that, but um, a good coverage linebacker. He'll slot in there, replace Miles Jack, who they cut sus unsuspectedly, which was unfortunate to see. Um, I think they will need some help in the secondary. They haven't really had 
uh, some great safety play out there recently. So um, I know uh, the safety from uh, Andrew Klein, I believe his name is, coming out of Georgia. He's a guy that's gotten some looks. Uh, or Lewis Klein might be his name. Uh, let me just uh, – oh, here we go. Yeah, but he's a safe – yeah, Lewis Klein out of Georgia. I think that could be a good position fit for them. Um, they do have some promising talent at cornerback uh, that we're just waiting to see develop. But, you know, Peter should be able to fire up that defensive unit out there. Um, uh, you know, maybe throw some offensive lineman picks in there, but maybe reach on a wide receiver later in the draft. Uh, see if you can get a guy that can really be a game changer. Because they let DJ Chark walk away, which I thought was an unfortunate deal. Uh, he's a really talented, physical wide receiver. Uh, Chenault needs to be a guy that needs to step up. I think it's the main issue out there in Jacksonville is that they need to get a culture change. I think Doug Peterson's got to bring that in there. He has a winning pedigree out there in Philadelphia. And um, I'd love to see them turn it around because Trevor Lawrence, like you said, he's an all-time talent in terms of a prospect. He's getting a guy who drives ETN alongside back with him. So they'll have a two-back system. Um, Should be interesting to see uh, how this team turns out. Because they could be picking first again, or they could be fringe wildcard team, as far as we know. It's always interesting when you have a so-called franchise quarterback come in. Usually year one's not good. Last year was special circumstance, and it was pretty bad for Jacksonville. Uh, You and I both live in Florida, so we hear about them more and more, even though we don't live in Jacksonville but it just seemed like every time I turned on my computer or the TV or looked at my phone, there was something negative with the Jaguars. It was just like, can they do anything else to get in their own way? It was just their fans were mad at them. They hate the owner. I mean, it. it's just – it's a really weird franchise, not just NFL, but worldwide. Like the fans in the NFL kind of – they linger on that craziness that you see in soccer in Europe and like in, you know, countries like Brazil where it's just life and death, but they were beating on them pretty good. So while I'm not a Jaguars fan, I'm hoping this draft goes well for them just to have some positivity, just to give them some hope because Trevor Lawrence, I don't want to see him rot on the vine because he doesn't have enough players. Like Barry Sanders retired early because he didn't, he knew he wasn't going to get to a Super Bowl. He's like, why in the heck am I beating myself up? I'm already rich. You just, Goodbye. I don't want to see that happen to him. So uh, it, it would be nice if a few of these picks worked out and they got some of the fringe stuff, as you talked about, with the off the field <laughs> taken care of. It, it's it's brutal. Um, the other two teams we mentioned, the Lions and the Giants. The Giants are historically a really good franchise. They have been most of my life. The Lions are on the other end. They're more like Jacksonville. They, they kind of get in their own way. Um but I, I want to throw something at you that we didn't even talk about before. And I'm going to give you a chance here. If you're the Rams, do you do anything to try? I mean, they're obviously not going to have a high pick. Do you do anything to try to shore up? Because they just went straight, and this usually doesn't work, straight heavy free agent to get over the top last year. Usually that just blows up, especially in Major League Baseball. It doesn't work. For whatever reason, they got guys to buy in. I mean, they got defensive stars. They got a quarterback through a lot of picks, but he still made big plays. And, of course, Cooper Cup was just absolutely incredible, man. What would you do if you're on the other end of the spectrum and you're the Rams? What are you looking to add? Forget the specific player. Let's talk position first. Where would you say their biggest need would be? You know, it's unfortunate when you use a guy in Andrew Whitworth who's, you know, a stalwart at left tackle, a guy that's, you know, captain that unit. And um, without him, it looks a little – looks a little dry. You know, they did re-sign his backup. Uh, and then Rob Havenstein's still over there on the right tackle side. I think that's a position they should look for. Look for a promising big body guy that can go over there and play left tackle, uh, be the blind side for Matthew Stafford. And just overall depth. Uh, you know, they lost some defensive um, line talent. Obviously, Von Miller walked away. Um, Sebastian Joseph Day headed over towards the uh, Chargers. Uh, it should be a team that is looking to revamp and not revamp, but re up their depth um, kind of all around. I mean, they got a lot of big name stars, obviously Bobby Wagner uh, cut ties with the Seahawks. Now he's over there. So they have a star linebacker, uh, Jalen Ramsey, of course, Aaron Donald's a one man wrecking unit. You, you don't yes, really get too many crazy guys around him and you still have Leonard Floyd. Who's a double digit sack guy coming off the edge as well. Um, I think they need to keep building in the trenches. Cause I like what they have at corner. Um, and, yeah, I'd say just sure up the offensive line, look for a tackle of some sorts, 
and uh, try and get uh, a big nose tackle uh, to continue uh, being that L.A. Rams that they are because uh, when they're on fire, there's no one that can start that Cooper Cup in uh, Matthew Stafford offense and especially Aaron Donald screaming at you wherever he's coming from the edge or inside. He can beat you anywhere. Yeah, the Rams are really interesting because while it's it's easy to pick and point at the teams in the top five to eight in the draft, they have obvious holes. People that can analyze the draft, it, it's harder at the back end because, number one, you don't know who's going to be there because you don't know who's going to get selected, who's going to slide or whatever, or somebody going to trade. But also it's how do we make this team work? We get picks first, second, third round or whatever. Do we trade out? I remember the 49ers, your favorite team, back in the day in the 80s and 90s, they used to draft after sliding down quite a bit. And then they would – they would every other year or so, they would move up. Uh, the famous trade they made right before – the Dallas Cowboys selected Jerry Rice was to move up a couple of spots right in front of the Cowboys, and the rest is history. I mean, if Jerry Rice goes to the Cowboys, the 49ers are the 49ers. I yeah. mean, literally. I mean, he's you know arguably the greatest receiver of all time. So if you look at the draft for the Rams, they got Cup, they have Ramsey, they have Donald, as you mentioned, but they did lose the big fellow at left tackle. So I'm curious if they might – I don't know which guy it would be because offensive line in the first round is, is hard to project – because that's more perception. I mean, you can you can only grade blocking so much, and it's you know what guy does it fit. But I think that would be a great pick for them because they, if they get the right guy, maybe they do trade up. It would be possible he could start right away. I mean, I'm not saying I condone starting a left tackle that's a rookie, but it's not out of the question because again, like you said, the guy that you just mentioned, I remember covering him when he was coming out of high school. When I first got it, I mean, he – Big LSU guy, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he's from northern Louisiana. He was a national recruit. Everybody knew he was going to be good, and the rest is – I mean, he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah, that was but, a great recruiting class because they got a Marcus Spears as well, who was a huge mm-hmm. prospect. As, yeah, that was a great national champion team. Yep. So it's an interesting situation because if you go out and get the quarterback and you go get a Super Bowl, that's good, but you have a chance with this roster – Maybe they don't win it this year, but over the next three to four years, you could win a few more. It's not, but if you if you don't protect your quarterback, you're not winning any. So I think that you're you're right. A left tackle is a great option for the Rams. Now the question is, do they have to move up? I, I trades are the most interesting thing to me in the draft. I don't know what your thoughts are, Liam, but oh, it's it's a blast because the guy comes up to the podium, just normal face, and he says, "Now we have a trade," and it's like, oh. You know, everybody, instead of, you know, somebody tied in from Arizona Wildcats, it's the Rams are trading with the Bears or, or whatever it is. So mm-hmm. which which team do you think in the top ten, if somebody wanted to slide up and get like Evan Neal or the big fellow from NC State or something like that, which team do you think would be most likely to slide down to get out of the top ten? and make You know, it could be Kyle Hamilton or anybody. Who do you think is most likely to move out of the top ten? That's an interesting situation. I think a team like Atlanta fits the mold. I feel like a guy that I've always poised uh, as the pick for them would be Drake London, the USC receiver. A yep. fantastic jump ball guy. He's getting comparisons to, you know, a Mike Williams, a Mike Evans. Um, I feel like they're a team that needs a lot to fill their voids because when it comes to skill players on their team, they don't have many. You know, Calvin Ridley, unfortunately, went through the gambling situation. He will not be playing this year. Kyle Pitts, as fantastic as he is, it's hard to be a one-man show on the receiving core when the guys on their team do not have many career receptions outside of him. Obviously, Cordell Patterson's a star, but who knows what he's going to look like going into a second year as he's continuing to age into his 30s. Um, I feel like that's a team that if you have a quarterback needy team or one of these offensive tackles is falling down the board, uh, I could see Atlanta trading out. And um, I've heard Detroit, if they get a big enough offer, I mean, as these teams always say, uh, they'll look to trade down as well. And they still have another first round pick via the Rams trade uh, for Stafford. But I, I'd say the hot, the uh, Falcons, they make the most sense in this situation because uh, they have a lot of voids to fill. And it's, you know, if there's a guy that's there, they see, is it really worth it to make the pick? You know, they could probably trade down and still get a receiver uh, maybe as talented uh, later on in the draft. Maybe they, you know, trade down from eight to uh, in the 20s and they still get a guy like Traylon Burks out of Arkansas who, Oh, he's, sure. He's good. He's, he's good. one of my favorite receivers going in this draft. Uh, I think he's going to be a prospect. So um, I'd have to say the Falcons. 
I think there's some some room for that. I, I kind of wonder if they're going to end up being a fire sale at some point in the next year or so, because if the skill thing doesn't work out this year with the way the rules work in the NFL, they could just be on the wrong end of a lot of scores and get outscored because, yeah, as you noted, Pitts is incredible. He's one of the most talented flex tight ends to ever walk the earth. But if you in any way slow him down, their offense by NFL standards is pretty pedestrian. So maybe they just trade out and maybe they, they may even take a pick that goes into next year or something as part of the package. I could see that. So, well, Em, I appreciate it, man. Uh, it's been a lot of fun. Um, we'll do this again soon. We got, we're not that far from the draft. We're a couple weeks away, but oh, yeah. um, it's, it's to the point now where we're going to start hearing as we were just talking about all the trade rumors, they're really going to start. And you know, how these general managers just make up garbage and tell, you know, Adam, you know, Schefter or whatever, pick your favorite person that covers the National Football League. Yeah. Somebody from Fox or NBC or whatever. I'm kind of curious to see what comes out because then you kind of see the BS on on the day of the draft because in like one out of the ten trades we heard about actually transpires. Mm -hmm. So, but then again, there'll probably be one we didn't hear anything about too. That usually happens, and that's hilarious. So that's why I enjoy the draft, especially day one, because the stakes are higher. But oh, yeah. uh, it, it's it's fun. Uh, anyway, man, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. We'll do this again soon. Take care. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Um